Hello, everyone. Welcome to the program. My name is James. I'm an adult services librarian at the New Canaan Library, and we are thrilled to bring you tonight's incredible program. So I want to just again welcome the presenters, and I'll let them introduce themselves and the program. Uh, we're so happy to have you, and uh, the floor is yours. Hello. Uh, we are all a part of uh, Yale University's Science in the News uh, as part of Yale Science Communication. Uh, and tonight, we're very excited to be talking to you about um, a very interesting topic, which is titled Brain Food, the Evolution and Application of Eating. And so before we actually dive into the presentation, I just want to give you a little bit of background about our two amazing speakers. Uh, so our first speaker tonight will be Audrey. Uh, she's a part of the Anthropology Department at Yale University, and she studies how our environment and history have contributed to the differences in uh, the genes of modern day human population. So how exactly uh, does our environment of the past ultimately impact who we as humans have become today? And a fun fact about uh, Audrey um, is that on a field dig in Oklahoma, she helped to butcher an entire bison using stone tools, which I think is absolutely incredible and bonkers. Uh, and then our second presenter tonight will be Grace, uh, who is a part of the cell biology department at Yale. And she studies how things move inside of the brains of worms. And hopefully we can take what she learns in these tiny worms and apply them to ourselves. And a fun fact about her is that she runs a game of Dungeons and Dragons every week for other graduate students at Yale. And so with that, uh, let's talk a little bit uh, and give you an introduction into what we'll be talking about today. So we know that humans have evolved over time, but our diets have also evolved along with us. So back in the, our, in the early days, our early ancestors would often scavenge for food about uh, anything that was around them that they could pick up and eat. And meanwhile, we can go down the street and pick up a Sally's Pizza anytime if you're in the New Haven area. And so our access to food has changed, which has ultimately impacted the way that we have developed and the choices that we make nowadays immediately impacts the development of who we are. And so to address these two topics, we'll first have Audrey who will talk about how our diet has changed as we evolved over time. And then Grace will follow up with how does our diet ultimately change our brain? And so with that, uh, Audrey, if you would like to share your screen and start us off. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, really glad to be here today for this talk. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about the evolution of the human diet, so how our diet has really changed over time and how it's affected us as humans. So this talk is going to have two different parts. First, we're going to take a look at ancestral diet, so what our ancestors ate, how this changed over time. And then the second part is going to look at um, some differences that we can still see in modern populations and then how diet led to these differences. So first of all, um, I wanted to give some context into why we even care about how what, what diet is and how it relates to people rather than just the food that we eat. Um, so there are several major hypotheses in um, the field of anthropology that suggest that major changes in human evolution are tied to changes in our food. Um, so basically by moving from food that doesn't give us a lot of nutrients, it's kind of hard for us to break down, um, like raw grass and leaves, um, to something that is a little bit more energetic and gives us more nutrients, um, like meat, um, we were also able to have more energy in our bodies, and that allowed us to do things like grow our bigger bodies and grow our bigger brains. So to give some context of um, really where we are um, in the human tree of life, uh, we can see that humans are up here at the very top of the tree. Um, and then the earliest humans are thought to have appeared about 300,000 years ago. So where you see um, this little red arrow here on the side. Um, so we're kind of at the top of the tree, we've survived. Um, but then if we go all the way back down to the bottom of our tree, these are what are believed to be um, our earliest ancestors that we know are on our line. 
Um, so about four to six million years ago, we have Artipithecus. Um, and Artipithecus were these kind of chimp-like um, early human ancestors. They probably lived in the trees. They had small bodies and small brains. And then jumping up um, about from three to four, three to five million years, um, we have Australopithecus. So Australopithecus um, is a little bit, uh, uh, they're, they're a little bit further on in the tree. They've grown bigger bodies. They've grown a little bit of a larger brain. Um, they've maybe moved out of the trees and they're living uh, more on this open land now. And then we even have cousins. Uh, so this is the Paranthropus group. There are no living Paranthropus today. Um, they range from about one to three million years ago, and at some point they all died out, so they are our extinct cousins. And then finally, we have us, the Homo group, and all of the members um, of Homo. So you might have heard of um, Neanderthal man before, and the Neanderthal is um, another species of Homo. And then finally, we have us, of course, Homo sapiens. Um, so keep this in mind as we uh, continue on uh, through this timeline. So then I wanted to go through some major um, advances in human diet, this timeline of human diet. Um, keeping in mind that there's a lot of changes that are occurring in between these points, um, but we're just focusing on these really major events and major advancements in the types of food that we ate. So we're going to be looking at things like uh, the first meat eating, fire use, cooking, and farming. Um, and first, I wanted to focus on these two points. So as we saw from that tree at about six, seven million years ago is when we see our first ancestors. So this is when humans are really starting on this different path from the other great apes. Um, and then 2.5 to 3 million years ago, we see evidence of the first uh, meat eating. So around this time from uh, about four to five million years ago, um, our human ancestors moved environments. So uh, it's believed that those early ancestors lived in a more forest, jungly like environment, like we see chimps and gorillas in today. Um, and they were probably eating things like leaves, tree bark, some insects. Um, but around this time, we moved to this open savanna land. So moving out from the trees, now living on the ground, um, and we now have access to a whole bunch of different types of uh, resources that we didn't see in the forest. There are more uh, larger bodied animals, for example. And what's really interesting is that around a similar time frame, we also see this major change in human behavior. Um, so our human ancestors around 3 million years ago started making tools. Um, so this is uh, a picture here of some of the oldest tools that have ever been found. Um, they're about 3.2 million years old, and you can see that they're um, very basic. They kind of don't even look like tools. They just kind of look like rocks. Um, but then by 2 million years ago, um, we start seeing stone tools that uh, we can really kind of start seeing a purpose for. They start having like really sharp edges, um, for example. And with these, uh, there were also new behaviors in the types of food that we could eat. So once we start having things that have um, sharp edges, we can start using it uh, to do things like this. So not really hunting, because by this point, our bodies are so small, um, but we could scavenge already dead animals for meat or potentially even like be crushing bones to try and get a bone marrow inside, all of which is a really important food um, resource that has a lot of energy. And another potential use would also be uh, looking for tubers. Um, things like potatoes and yams in the ground, um, which we can use tools to access, and they are also a major, major source of energy. And so we can see this access to more food happening during the same time period that we're moving out um, into a new landscape. So then the next uh, thing, next few events we're going to be talking about kind of go together. Um, and we're jumping forward in time a lot here. So now we're going from 2.5 million years ago to 1.8 million and then 780,000 years ago. So it's a big leap. Um, there's a lot of events happening in between, um, but this is really, again, just the major dietary um, changes that are occurring. So we see the first fire use and then we see the evidence of cooking. So the first evidence of fire use comes around 1.8, 1.5 million years ago. Um, and at this point, humans probably were not controlling fire in any way, um, but instead, uh, 
early human ancestors might have been attracted um, to areas with fire. So um, in the African savanna environment, there are often wildfires started by um, lightning, for example. So it could be that these wildfires were killing animals or causing them to abandon their nests, um, and those would have been really uh, useful sources of food. So early humans might have been attracted to these areas where, where uh, wildfires were um, to get at that food. But then by about 780,000 years ago, um, we start seeing evidence of uh, humans being able to control fire. So this is an example of a seed, a burn seed, um, that was found at a site just outside of Africa um, at about that 800,000 years, 780,000 years ago mark. Um, and with all these seeds that we see in this area, it really seems to be evidence that humans were um, burning these seeds uh, deliberately. And then by around 400,000 years ago, we see evidence of fire pretty much everywhere. Um, it's in Africa, it's in Europe, it's in Asia. So we can really see by this time period that was um, you know, very long ago, 400,000 years ago, um, fire has become a really important part of uh, the human lifestyle. And the reason why that is so important is because of the use of fire in cooking. Um, so cooking makes food a lot easier to break down. It softens it and it's easier for us to get nutrients out of it. So if we were eating things like raw wheat, um, that's what this is a picture of here, um, it really is the same as eating cardboard. We might as well be eating cardboard for all the nutrients that we could get out of it. Um, but then if we are actually cooking it, um, so this is a picture of some wheat berries here, it becomes a lot easier for our stomach to digest and we're getting a lot more energy and nutrients from it. And this was a study that was actually done. Um, the study looked at uh, the difference in wheat that's raw and cooked, and they found that it became 34% uh, more digestible once we actually start cooking food. And what's really interesting about this is that it's a change that we can actually see in the bodies of our human ancestors and in our bodies. So we can see that humans have adapted um, because fire and cooking uh, come from so far in our past, we have adapted to this cooked diet. And we can see that in our teeth and in our skulls. So if we take a closer look at the teeth here, um, if you remember back from the tree, this is one of our ancestors here, Australopithecus, so from about that three to four million years ago mark. And then this is uh, Homo sapiens uh, teeth, lower jaw. And if you focus in on the back teeth here, um, you might see this difference in size. Australopithecus has huge back teeth compared to Homo sapiens back teeth. Um, and it's been hypothesized that Australopithecus needed these really large back teeth um, because they were eating these raw, hard foods. So they really needed to grind down on those to break them down. Whereas Homo sapiens, because we are eating uh, softened cooked food, we no longer need those. So now if we look at uh, some skulls, so this again is the same Australopithecus. This here is Paranthropus. So remember these are our extinct cousins, they're not around anymore. And then this is Homo sapiens. So this is one of our skulls. And if we look at a couple of distinct features on here, first of all, our lower jaw, then we have this ridge on the top of our heads. And then finally, this arch right here. Um, and what you might see in terms of the lower jaw is how small ours is compared to these two here. And then uh, same thing with this arch on the side of our heads. We can see how skinny it is in humans compared to these two. They have a thick arch. And then when you look at the top of the head, the human top of the head is pretty flat, whereas these two have this point that you can really see and kind of a ridge here running along the top of their head. And the idea is that all of these features um, for these two here, Australopithecus and Paranthropus, were needed for their muscles to attach to um, because of all the stress that it takes to really chow down on raw, hard food. Um, whereas in humans, because we have now adapted to cooking and we're eating soft food, we don't have to use all the energy to make these really large jaw bones and large arches here. Um, so it's really like a, a visible change over time um, of what this change in diet has done uh, to our bodies. 
right? Um, so then the final um, change that I wanted to talk about is early farming. Um, and as you might see from this timeline here in this yellow diamond, um, this is really the only change uh, that we're talking about after um, we see the first Homo sapiens. So everything that comes before it, we can really think of these as incremental changes that increased how much energy we could get. Um, and it all contributed to the evolution of Homo sapiens here. So with farming, this was another major, major change in the human lifestyle. Um, so we moved from this kind of hunting gathering lifestyle where we were eating um, more nuts and seeds, um, a very uh, varied diet. Um, and now we're choosing one or two plants and raising them as crops. We're settling down. Um, so our diet is becoming a lot less diverse. Um, but at the same time, we now have so much energy coming in because we can control how much food we're growing. Um, and this leads to a big uh, growth in population for humans. And um, because we're really changing what we're eating, this could also be uh, another pressure um, for some of these, these traits, physical traits that are related to diet. All right, so now that we've kind of gone through this timeline um, of major changes in um, the human diet over time, um, I wanted to look at a very specific example of differences in a modern population as a result of some of this uh, history of diet. Okay, so um, you might be familiar with this kind of simplified food pyramid here. Um, I think we're often told that you want to have uh, a good balance of grains and cereals, fruits and veggies, and proteins. Um, but often we're told that you don't want a lot of fats and sugars. You know, we really want to cut down on ice cream or fried foods. Um, but really, there are a lot of different types of fats that our body needs um, as part of a balanced diet. Um, so things like olive oil, fish oil, um, oils from nuts and seeds, um, these are all good lipids. And here lipids is just another word for fats. Um, and in Grace's talk, you'll hear her um, talk a lot more about the structure of these fats and what they actually do in our body. Um, but for the purposes of uh, this talk, all you really need to know is that fatty acids are the building blocks of fats. Um, so by putting together a bunch of fatty acids, you can get different types of fats. So there are both uh, short and long chain fatty acids. Um, and they can be found in different foods. So just like we can see uh, with the little repeating circles here, short chain fatty acids, like they sound, um, are like these repeating linked units of fatty acids, but they're pretty short. And these can be found in foods like eggs, uh, leafy greens, meats, and nuts and seeds. But then we also have long chain fatty acids. And just like they sound, um, these are longer in length, um, and these are found in different types of food. So these are mostly found in foods that come from aquatic resources. Um, so from our oceans, lakes, and rivers. And they include things like seaweed, fish, clams, shrimp, um, and even uh, mammals like whales and seals. And what's interesting is that our body needs both of these. We can't just have short uh, chain acids and we can't just have long chain fatty acids. We need both because they each perform their own function in the body. And for long chain fatty acids, one really, really important role that it plays or that these play um, is helping to make up the structure of our brain. So our brains really need these long chain fatty acids um, to develop normally. So if our diet is different though, like let's say I have no access to fish, um, but I need these long chain fatty acids, uh, what would we do? And we found that our body actually has a way to make these long chain fatty acids from shorter ones. So we have this gene that's known as FADS, and you can really think of our genes as like an operating system for our body. Um, it tells our body exactly what we need to do um, to run normally. So this FADS gene makes an enzyme, which is also called FADS. And uh, you can think of an enzyme as something that just has a very, very specific function. And FADS function is to take these free-floating um, small fatty acid links, and it's going to find them, 
find a short chain fatty acid, and then link them up together to make these longer fatty acids. So then now that it's done that, this long chain fatty acid can go do its job and help make up the brain structure. Um, so then some scientists wanted to look a little bit deeper into the structure of this FADS gene. And they wanted to know if it might differ um, between people. And that's exactly what they found. So let's say that these two um, on the, the left here, they have version one of the FADS gene. And version one just means that at this particular location, they have this purple stripe. And if you have version one, you make one copy of that FADS enzyme. And that one FADS enzyme can do the job of making uh, one long fatty acid. It's pretty inefficient just on its own. But then these two here on the right, they have version two. So instead of that purple stripe there, they have a red stripe. And with that uh, red stripe, they can make two copies of the FADS enzyme. And these two are a little bit more efficient. They can produce more of that long chain fatty acid. And um, so whereas these two could only produce one, these two can produce three. Um, so then in the last slide, I just mentioned that we really need these long chain fatty acids for our brain. Um, so you might be thinking, why would we ever want this version, right? Why would we want version one and have less um, fatty acid? So to answer that question, we really have to look back at the diet of different populations. So some scientists wanted to look at exactly why people might have that version one. And they looked at a very uh, specific, unique population, um, the Greenlandic Inuit. So if you've ever heard of the Inuit, you might know that they live up in these Arctic regions um, where it's pretty hard to grow any types of crops. And so their food consists mostly of these um, aquatic uh, animals. So this is whale meat, um, fish, and then seals. So if you compare that to a nearby population of Europeans, um, they have a much more varied diet. So they're eating things like breads and pastas, um, still some meat and fish, and then some vegetables and fruits. So it's quite different. So these scientists wanted to know, is there a difference in the Inuit because their diet is so different from a lot of people in the world? And that's exactly what they found with this FADS gene. So they found that in the Inuit, FADS really helped to make up for that fat-heavy diet um, by um, having this, this version one of the gene. So if they had version one, um, the Inuit that had version one had much lower weights on average than ones that had version two. And along with this uh, lower weight, there was lower risk for things like heart disease or high cholesterol. Um, so things, uh, diseases that are associated with uh, a fat heavy diet. So it really seems like this is a, a good example of where we see um, this change in fads because of the diet. So then um, some scientists wanted to look at this in other populations and all the populations of the world. So just to recap, uh, remembering that purple is version one here and it's less efficient. We're only making one copy of each. Whereas version two, the red is more efficient. And now we're making uh, two copies of fads and more long chain fatty acid. So this is the pattern that they found when they looked in all the populations of the world. So this purple circle up here, that's the Inuit population. And we can see that they um, have very, very high numbers of that version one of the gene that's less efficient. Um, and that pattern seems to be echoed in these populations that live by aquatic resources that are already eating a lot of long chain fatty acids. So for example, here in Indonesia, we can also see um, that almost all purple here. Whereas in populations like this in Africa, where they're a little bit more landlocked and they don't have such easy access um, to aquatic resources, um, they have very, very high numbers of that version two. Um, so they don't need to be eating as much because their bodies are really making it for themselves. So this is a really, really interesting example of um, how diet causes a visible, um, noticeable difference in populations around the world. Um, and it's really changed our genes. 
So I hope overall that this talk has really shown you that food is more than just the things we eat. Um, it has really influenced our evolution. Um, the access that we have to food has influenced our evolution. Um, and that humans have really evolved to eat this diet that has uh, protein and it has fat and it has uh, starches. Um, and in cases where we can't have access to that, like in the Inuit, our bodies and genes reflect that. We can really see um, that they can make up for that, that difference in our diet. All right, so now that we've kind of gone through this whole timeline, we've gone through millions of years, we are going to focus in on the present day with Grace's talk. Um, so she is really going to focus in on different types of fats, what they're made of, and then the different roles that they play in our body on a short-term time scale now. All right, thank you. Okay, great work, Audrey. My turn. All right, you can see. Great. Okay, guys, um, thank you for having me. I'm gonna follow up on Audrey's talk um, by discussing how what we eat affects our bodies. And uh, my talk is gonna focus on fat and the brain. So let me get started. So as you just heard from Audrey, um, during evolution, we went through many diets over millions of years. However, now with global trade, we can change our diet dramatically on a short time scale. However, um, even though we have that power to eat something insanely different every single day, um, if we want to, it's important that we stay balanced in what we eat, that we don't go to any specific extreme. Now, extremes are really bad for your body, and I will give you my, my self-deprecating anecdote about that. So I'm a graduate student. I'm a fourth-year graduate student, and graduate students work a lot. Um, so often, I end up not being able to eat dinner until like eight or nine o'clock at night. And for me, that's really late. Um, so sometimes I'll be really tired and I'll be at the lab um, and I'll be like, well, we have all this candy and I'm gonna have a Snickers. Now, one Snickers in the grand scheme of things is not so bad for you. I mean, this is a uh, processed food, which you're supposed to avoid. Um, but I, one thing I want to stress is I, I don't think you should feel consumed with guilt about um, what you eat. And I think it's completely human to occasionally eat things that, that are not ideal for you. However, what ends up being bad is, let's say you are a, a tired graduate student, and you end up eating a bunch of candy for dinner uh, because you're too busy to go home, and you do that maybe multiple times a week. That's super bad for you, and you'll end up feeling like I feel sometimes, um, maybe not hungry, but really awful, like kind of tired and cranky and have a headache, maybe have an upset stomach, and, you know, your energy won't be as good. So I think kind of that, that illustrates, even though you can eat something and it will relieve your hunger, um, it's just not necessarily always going to be good for you. I think in general, I want to emphasize that you're healthier and you feel better with balance. When you seek a variety in your diet, there's so many delicious foods in our world. And because of global trade, uh, we have access to a huge variety of them and we can seek to eat lots of interesting vegetables and fruits and grains and legumes and meats if we wish, and really nourish our bodies and our spirits by doing so. Now, in my talk today, I'm going to focus on just one nutrient and all the food that we can seek out, and that nutrient is fat, and I'm going to tell you about how fat affects your brain and how we need a variety of fat, and that's going to be kind of my, um, my microcosm for the argument of seeking balance in all aspects of your diet. So why do we care so much about fat? Well, first, I want to talk about why we care about the brain, and I think that's obvious. Your brain is probably arguably the most important organ in your body, and your brain is 50% fat. If you dried out your brain and you weighed it on a scale, it's half fat, um, and that emphasizes how important fat is to the brain, and also it turns out that there are hundreds of different kinds of fats in the brain, and the brain is going to need all of them to function and to do different things. So it's good to seek out those different fats. Now, going even more into fat, I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about the chemistry of fat so you can understand some common terms that are used to describe fat. So the first one I'm going to start off with is saturated fat. Now, what goes into a fat? Um, you'll see a C, that's for carbon, H, that's for hydrogen, and O, that's for oxygen. Those are the most common elements of the fat. 
So if we looked into a saturated fat, um, we would see a saturated fat has a certain shape. And in general, the shape of a fat determines its function. Saturated fats are straight. Saturated fats always have a small group that has oxygens on one end. And they have a, uh, oops, uh, and they have a long tail of carbons and hydrogens that's past this small group. Furthermore, you might notice here, there are two lines connecting this carbon and this oxygen, and that's a double bond. That means these two elements are cl physically closer to each other um, than elements that are connected with just a single bond. And that's actually gonna matter for the next fat I'm gonna talk about. Now, unsaturated fats, my sort of simple cartoon depiction of the unsaturated fat has it with a bend. And that is how the fat actually looks like. The reason it has a bend is it has a double bond in the middle. It's still got that small groove with oxygens, just like a um, saturated fat. But the unsaturated fat will have a double bond at least somewhere um, in its middle. Now, um, I think uh, saturated fats are usually described as being really uh, bad for you, but our body needs a balance of both unsaturated and saturated fats. They both play a role in the body. Talking more about saturated fats, um, which again has this one small group um, with the oxygens and then this long tail. The long tail has only single bonds and that's what lets it be saturated with hydrogens, meaning it has a whole bunch of hydrogens. Um, and then saturated fats are stiff and stable molecules. So they're generally solid at room temperature. Um, so, when you, so when you would find them in meat and in some vegetables um, and like in coconut oil, you would notice that that uh, like, uh, I don't know, like the fat on a pork chop that you're gonna cook or the, um, the fat that's coconut oil is solid at room temperature. And that's just a kind of a key characteristic of a saturated fat. Unsaturated fats, on the other hand, um, their long tail has at least one double bond and that physically forces the fat to fold. It changes its shape and thereby it changes its function. Um, this bent molecules have different properties. And what ends up happening is these bent molecules um, appear as liquids. So when you see a fat that is liquid at room temperature, you can basically always know it's an unsaturated fat and you're gonna get that um, from most plant fats, like olive oil you use in cooking, um, and also in fish fat. I also want to talk about omega-3 fatty acids because they're a really popular kind of fat. And I would agree based on the, the literature, sort of the published scientific knowledge about omega-3 fatty acids, that they're probably the best fat for you. They are unsaturated fats and they're special because they are super bent. They have many double bonds in their long tail, not just one. They're really, really long as well. Um, and they're most common in fish fat, which is why people will sometimes take fish oil capsules to get even more omega-3 fatty acids. So I, I strongly recommend the omega-3 fatty acids. However, I want to emphasize again, our body needs both kinds of fat. And you can think of that in a simple way. You need to be flexible and sturdy. If you were all unsaturated fat, like an olive oil, you would be a liquid. Um, and you would be able to function. But and of course, if you were all saturated fat, you would be like a, like a delicious meat statue. So you need some, some kind of uh, intermediate in order to, uh, to get around in the world. Now, how does our body actually make use of these saturated and unsaturated fats? Um, to talk about this, I'm gonna go into some detail on four very important kinds of fat in our body. And I'm gonna start with phospholipids. So phospholipids, I love this illustration of the clasped hands because that actually ends up looking a lot like phospholipids look like in the body. Um, breaking down the name phospholipids, phospho means it contains the element phosphorus and lipid just means fat. We'll use lipid over and over again in this talk. Phospholipids are the fundamental component of all cell membranes. So every single cell in your body has plenty of phospholipids there to protect it. And the fingers of the phospholipids that are making up your cell membrane, some of them are saturated and some are unsaturated. And that actually provides phospholipids with a lot of flexibility on how they uh, interact with the environment and shape the surface of the cell. And what that actually ends up looking like is there's two layers of phospholipids with their long tails intertwining, like fingers intertwining, and they form what's called the uh, phospholipid bilayer. 
Um, and this is what you'll find on the outside of every cell in your body. Moving on, I will talk about sphingolipids. So um, the entire picture I, I really like, and it will, uh, it will become more clear in time. But the sphingolipid first, starting with the name, uh, sphingo means sphinx-like or mysterious. And the reason it has this name is because sphingolipids were one of the latest lipids to be studied and understood by scientists. Um, I can't see my, where'd it go? Oh, there we go, yes. <laughs> and um, I have a picture of the uh, sphinx in Egypt because that's what sphingo means, means uh, sphinx-like. And then of course, lipid needs fat. Now, sphingolipids actually physically wrap the cell, like bubble wrap, uh, and they're very stiff and resistant, so they provide a lot of protection to the cell. And they're actually made from saturated fat, so that's a good example of saturated fat being helpful. And what it ends up looking like is if you have this sort of imaginary uh, cartwheel, the center of the wheel would be the cell, and the sphingolipids would be this tough but flexible exterior that's cushioning the cell and protecting it from its environment. And as another example, here is an actual um, electron micrograph of a cell in the center of that more kind of clear circle. And it's surrounded by these dense wrapped layers of sphingolipids along with other components. I won't, I won't go into this too much, but I just wanted you to see this picture so you can, uh, you can see it. It really does um, look like this incredibly thick layer around the outside of the cell. Next, we'll talk about glycolipids. So glycolipids, glyco just means sugar, and lipid means fat. Uh, so a glycolipid is a fat molecule with a sugar attached. It's nice and straightforward. And it's this ID card that tells your body that this is your cell. So it's really important for your immune system. It's a highly saturated fat, but it's really small. So it's like a little small stiff badge. Uh, and you get these glycolipids decorating the outside of the phospholipid bilayer and um, kind of telling your body, this belongs to me, don't attack it. So of course, it's crucially important um, to protect you from autoimmune disorders and just in general, the health of your body. Then finally, I'll talk about cholesterol. Um, so cholesterol has a weird name, but it's still a fat. Chol means from the liver and esterol means an alcohol group. Um, and that ends up meaning it's got some extra oxygen and hydrogen compared to other fats. Now, cholesterol is a really important cell support structure. Um, however, when it's not performing its role in, in actually supporting a cell and it gets kind of outside the cell environment, um, it has its damaging role, which probably most of you are familiar with, um, that can lead to heart problems. However, this is um, what I hope cholesterol should, shouldn't be totally known for. Cholesterol is an incredibly important molecule uh, and it is protecting you and it's keeping you alive almost all the time. So when it's behaving, this very unusual fat is going to form like a chain mail coating around your cell to protect it. Because cholesterol, um, unlike most fats, it's not actually a long chain. It forms a ring. And this weird shape gives it some additional flexibility uh, in how it can protect your cell. So going back out, I introduced these specific fats. So um, now you know some more about specific fats that are in your body. And I'm going to talk about how these fats help the brain. So first off, I would say your brain cells are really big, and so they need a lot of fat. Most cells are very, very, very small. This is my example of a standard cell, and it is not to scale. Um, this size would be about 0 0.000002 feet long, um, smaller than a speck of dust, impossible to see with your eyes. You need a microscope to see it. But many of you may know the sciatic nerve, which I'm well familiar with because I have a lot of back pain. The sciatic nerve is many feet long. It's 10,000 times as long as a standard cell. And the sciatic nerve is one cell, one single cell. So you can imagine the sciatic nerve has facing a lot of challenges the standard cell doesn't by being 10,000 times as long. Furthermore, the sciatic Nerve is undergoing a lot of, of pressure as you go throughout your life. So your sciatic nerve, it's running through your leg. Every single time you walk and you bend your knee, you're bending one single cell in the middle. And in order to resist that stress, that cell has got to be both flexible and sturdy. And so in order to have those properties, it's got a combination of sturdy, saturated fats and flexible, unsaturated fats. So how do these specific fats help your sciatic nerve, just as an example? 
So phospholipids, I said, form the cell membrane and they're flexible. So they're gonna help with um, the ability of your nerve to flex. Sphingolipids are protecting the nerve. They're sturdy. So they're making sure the nerve stays intact even when it's flexing. Glycolipids are labeling the nerve. So they're making sure that you don't have a horrible autoimmune disease that attacks your nerve. And cholesterol, the kind of the weird chain mail fat can either be flexible or sturdy. Um, so it provides like a whole bunch of different benefits to your nerve. So just overall, they're all helping to protect the nerve and helping it function. So I told you that these fats are in your brain, but you might wonder, well, how do, how do we know what fats are in the brain? And the answer to that is really cool. It's a science called lipidomics. So breaking this word up, lipidomics, um, lipid means fat and omics is big data. So it's the study of sort of the fat from many different sources. And we use this science to understand exactly what kind of fats are in the brain. And we do, when we do that, we get um, data that tells us like relatively how much of each kind of fat is in the brain. To find this information, you take a brain and then well, you're gonna chop it into pieces. And once you've chopped the brain into pieces, you're gonna do a bunch of fancy things to each slice of the brain. And you'll eventually be able to measure how much of each lipid is in each slice and thereby figure out how much of each lipid is in each portion of the brain. Um, now, once we have what proportion of fat is in each area of the brain, which is called the lipidome, we can measure how it changes. Um, so we can ask questions like, how does diet change what fats are in the brain? So in this experiment, this was done fairly recently, um, the researchers fed three uh, special diets to either adult mice or pups or baby mice. And the three diets were fish oil capsules, safflower oil, and beef tallow. And those three diets correspond to diets that are rich in omega-3 fatty acids, unsaturated fat, and saturated fat. So I've talked about all three of those fats in my talk. So the researchers got data in the form of a heat map. To read a heat map, all you need to know is that a darker color means you see more of something. So what the researchers found is that, for example, if you fed the mice diet A, that would increase levels of example fat one. But in comparison, if you fed the mice diet B, it would decrease the levels of fat one. Um, then they can get the overall conclusion that diet A has more of fat one than diet B. Now they applied this to all the hundreds of fats that are in the brain and looked at these three diets. And their overall and I think really important conclusion was that you can change in weeks the proportion of fats in the brain with these different diets. And this is in big contrast to what Audrey talked about where our diet over millions of years affected our evolution and our ability to consume different nutrients. Instead, on a very short time scale, we can radically alter the proportions of fat in our body. So I think in conclusion, I wanna talk about, although our diets have always affected us as humans, um, I think and nowadays we really have to worry about how they affect us on a short, time scale instead of really influencing like the development of our, what kinds of teeth we have or what kinds of jaw we have um, we can actually make big changes to our brain in a very short time scale just based on what we eat and that's and I think in a way comforting you know even if you make a bad decision like me and you're you're having your snickers for dinner um, we have research that shows that if you are eating a good proportion of fats, it really does actually change your body. Um, so I think it's really uh, hopeful that as long as you are going and choosing a diverse diet, it is always possible to kind of readjust these proportions in your body and sort of seek health and seek balance. Um, so I want to thank you all for your uh, time and attention. And I I, don't know, I encourage you to go out and eat lots of fruits and vegetables.
And that concludes uh, our talk for today. Um, I did see that we had a couple of questions in chat. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions you have, so feel free to put them in the chat. Um, so the first question, which I think uh, was answered in the chat, but is worth revisiting is, um, occasionally I have heard that we should eat raw food, vegetables. What are the benefits of this? Um, so I, I talked about this in the chat. Um, but I think, so I think one idea, and Andre, this is also relevant to you, Audrey, we get a lot more energy out of food that we don't have to work to digest. Um, but I think one concern people have is like the idea of preserving valuable uh, vitamins and minerals. Um, so for example, we would see something like uh, blueberries have a lot of antioxidants, which is really, really good for us. Um, but then there's a concern, like what if you're not I don't know, living in the woods of Maine and you can't have a wild blueberry and you have to have a frozen blueberry, is that still as good for you? Or if you make a blueberry muffin, in addition to it being tasty, are you getting any benefit out of it? Um, so I would say from breeding, it seems, it, 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 it varies in some things actually, they retain a little bit more vitamins and minerals when frozen, some things lose a little bit when cooked, but I would say overall the effect is not significant and it's just far more important to prioritize um, what is it? Eat, eat mostly vegetables, not too much. Um, try not to eat super processed food. Don't eat a bunch of Snickers. That that's that's more important, I think, as an overall philosophy. Yeah, and I think this goes to another question that was asked here about like uh, like how much fat exactly is a desirable amount. Um, and again, I think that's something that like can't be answered on a really general basis. It's really person to person. You might want to talk to a doctor or dietitian. Um, but in terms of like raw food and fats, um, like it, it really seems that for raw food, um, our bodies have evolved to eat this cooked food. And that is part of the reason why um, sometimes people go on a raw food diet when they want to lose weight. Um, our bodies just have a harder time breaking it down. Um, so you're maybe not getting as many calories out of it as you would cooked food. Yeah, and thanks for following up on that the question about uh, us avoiding fats and what a desirable amount is. It seems like it depends on the person. It depends on your genes. It depends on where you are. There's a lot of different factors. So Nancy, um, I'll just talk over you abruptly, Shannon. Nancy, <laughs> talking totally about percentages. Fine, right? So I think when I talk about omega-3 fatty acids, that's an incredibly broad term. Um, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of fats in your brain, and some of them contain or could, could be classified as omega-3 fatty acids, uh, and some cannot. So I don't, I don't have like a good number for that. Um, uh, the, one of the problems with science are these these great lipidomics papers. They're very highly detailed. They're so detailed that it's hard to get some an answer like that. Like you you can only get percentages of exactly the kind of fat and not the um not the overall kind. But I think it's it is generally accepted by scientists that omega a diet that's rich in omega three fatty acids is good for your brain. And I will say, um, especially for developing brains too. So. Um... I didn't mention this in my talk, but you might see like uh, like prenatal vitamins or like uh, baby formula commercials where they talk about like DHA. Um, so that is actually one of those long chain fatty acids. Um, and part of the reason why they say mothers and young babies should be taking it is um, for, you know, normal growth of the brain. I don't know if I can steal the article for you, Nancy, uh, but basically, I don't know. It, it's basically those things. What does it say? It says leafy greens, Mediterranean diet, colorful fruits and vegetables. But I mean, a, a lot of that is like, it makes sense, right? I don't know. I, f I feel like it's, it's natural to be like, you should eat lots of fruits and vegetables. And that, that is what the article says. Family history of heart disease. Oh, that's tricky. Um, I'm not a medical doctor. Um, and I would just say probably go to your doctor a lot, get lots of checkups. Um, I, I, I've heard, at least my, my own dad had a high cholesterol and he really changed his diet. Um, and that was helpful to him, but I, I don't think I'm not a medical doctor. So I feel like I, I feel uncomfortable talking about that too much, I guess. Um, fish oil is supposed to be very good for Alzheimer's. Um, and, and generally the, the way they get this research is they'll survey thousands of adults. Um, and they'll say, okay, these people ate mostly this diet. 
and that and they tended to have Alzheimer's appear a few years later than other adults. Um, so these are all what we call observational studies. Mm -hmm. They're not, they're just like, you know, you kind of look out the window and you're seeing birds fly by and you're counting the birds. And so you're maybe not getting like a full picture, like, why are the birds flying? Why are they so it's fast? Why are they so slow? It's very general, but in general, I think the Mediterranean diet is supposed to be very good for your brain. Yeah, we love olive oil. Olive oil is, is the hot oil right now coconut oil is very bad for you how about that i i feel comfortable saying that. <laughs> i mean everything is fine in moderation but i think coconut oil is particularly uh prevalent um but yeah I, I think you know everybody everybody instinctively knows what they're supposed to every we all i think know we're supposed to eat more vegetables um it's just hard to do that and i'm very sympathetic because i i really struggle with that myself even though i know all this stuff I don't think safflower oil is that fancy. I mean, I think they, they, they just chose it for this study because it's just like a very boring, unsaturated fat. The flowers are pretty though. Yeah, so coconut oil is a saturated fat and saturated fats are good for you in moderation. I mean, your body needs saturated fat, um, but I think there is there is some prevalence um there's there's some trends of like putting of, of basically having way way too much coconut oil mm -hmm. so i would say just just in i would i would not eat more coconut oil than you would normally use does that make sense i don't uh, know it might MCP also is. not be better to cook with butter butter is also a well, butter is, <laughs> okay so as a southerner i am pro butter <laughs> i am pro butter <laughs> Um, I don't have a clue about sciatica. I have very bad sciatica, Nancy, I'll, I'll tell you. Um, and it seems like the best possible thing for sciatica is to do ab exercises. If you have really strong abdominal muscles, it's actually really good for your, um, for your back pain because it helps support your back. Um, one of the things I liked, uh, John, from this article talking about fish oil, they said, you are not a seal. Don't eat fish like you're a seal. Um, <laughs> But I mean, I would talk maybe your doctor or a dietitian. But I would say, I don't know. It's hard. It's hard to say something like this because once again, I'm not a doctor or a dietitian. Right. And again, that all has different factors. It's you as an individual. It's your your um, genetic history, your population history. Um, like we saw in my talk, like what might be right for an Inuit might not be right for you. I would say probably we're at the point where I should be like talk to your actual doctor. <laughs> I'm just a, I'm just a little cell biologist. Um, yeah, we will be doctors, but not medical doctors. Yeah, that's about <laughs> the wrong kind of doctor. <laughs> uh, there's things like, yeah. I, as like as a woman, I should probably be taking calcium supplements. Like most women uh, end up suffering from calcium deficits. Uh, so things like that are, I think are good. But I mean, in general, guys, you know, just, just talk to your doctors. If, if you feel like you could be doing better, just talk to your doctor. Don't listen to me <laughs> too, too much anyway. But at least you'll have a better understanding of the information. Yeah. But yeah, these are all absolutely fantastic questions. Um, we can stick around for the next five minutes if anyone else has any questions, uh, but that seems to conclude the rest of our talk. Um, we wanna thank uh, New Canaan Library and all of you guys for joining us today um, and hope you have a wonderful evening. Uh, so I'll comment, Nancy. I think, uh, I, I agree. I think it's good to try and focus on getting nutrients from actual food rather than supplements in general. I'm, I'm, I think supplements can all often be like way, way, way more than you actually need. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that's something you would talk to your doctor about if you had a risk factor for something, maybe you would have to take it. Um, Betty, raw versus cooked, I think there are some extremely mild differences depending on the ingredient, but I don't think it really matters. I think overall, what's more important is that you're making the choice to eat anything that's good for you, and it raw or cooked doesn't really matter. Well, it looks like, oh, another question. 
Eliza, too much or too little? I think that probably you would do you um, would get a, your blood taken by your doctor every few years, and they can tell you these percentages. Um, that's actually what they did for quite a few of the fat studies. Oh, that's that's looking cool. at different populations, is looking at um, lipid blood levels. Yeah, I think other than that, you know, you just try and be uh, try and be reasonable. Otherwise, you don't know until your blood gets taken. Unfortunately, in, in a way, it's good. Like your body can survive a lot of punishment. I'm feeling pretty <laughs> good despite my Snickers heavy diet, even though I'm not supposed to. Um, and it's it's awesome. The human body can really uh, cope with even not right. treating it very well. So you you may not actually feel any different, but a test may reveal something is not great. I'm envious of your health, Emmy. Yeah. I, I would like to not have this sciatica. It's horrible. And flowers? I don't think you couldn't talk, Anne. Oh, well, yeah. You might have to type it out in the chat. Uh, yes, oh, uh, she's asking, um, yeah, as we age, how does the fat affect our bodies? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, so my knowledge here is, uh, okay, here, here are just a few things. Um, there are some recent studies that if you're over 50, it's more important and you get more of a benefit from eating these omega a diet that's more heavy in omega-3 fatty acids. Um, and then my other piece of data is that your fat distribution on your body changes a lot. I think especially for women in menopause, like where you store your fat is in a different place. Um, but I guess otherwise, I don't, I don't, I don't know enough to comment on that. I don't know what a nootropic is. Let's Google it. It looks like they're uh, like a type of medication. Or like oh, I don't know. This sounds suspicious. Just go Googling it. I'm already. Yeah. I Again, I think this is kind of falls into the supplement um, side of things where you might want to uh, talk to a doctor or nutritionist um, before taking any of those. Doctors, I feel like one, one thing just to keep in mind when you're considering supplements is scientists and doctors are often hesitant about saying things really definitively, as you guys may have noticed, because we're really focused on what can we say that is backed up by data. Right. So if you're reading a website and they're like, this drug is going to make you smarter, period, <laughs> I would be suspicious of that. I mean, I would expect any drug to be like, there are some studies that have shown some improvement in a small population and therefore with some caution we might recommend this um but just googling it this i'm instantly really suspicious i have to say uh, as a librarian um i uh, applaud uh, what grace just said there um we <laughs> always encourage uh information literacy and skepticism a little bit when you find something that says it is definitive like that um uh, we got a lot of calls asking about that sometimes um but um, that's about it for tonight's program. That's about all the time we have. Uh, I'd like to you know, thank the panelists again for just an incredible uh, presentation, um, answering all these, these questions as well. Um, you, you are all stupendous. Um, thank you so much for being here. And uh, we, we hope to have you again someday, honestly. This, is, this was just great. Thank you so much.